Perhaps one of the most evil, though innocuous looking things, to creep up in recent years are small aerial drones for domestic use. Drones aren't new, but they've become cost effective to the point where it's cheaper to build a no thrills drone than to buy a couple of tires or do your shopping. I dare say in a few years you might be able to buy one at Walmart for 1998. It'll break and fall apart and possibly be made in China, but the thought of that should give you pause. This is one of those inventions where the perversion of use is of far greater consequence than productive use. Indeed, I can only come up with one good use, border security, and terrifying after terrifying bad uses. Spying on your neighbor, spying on your girlfriend or boyfriend, spying on the Tea Party rallies, or any leftist rally if you feel comfortable, misuse by law enforcement agencies, and the federal conglomerate agencies like the EPA should alarm everybody. The EPA wanted to regulate rainwater in your backyard, uses hidden emails to avoid records, and destroys evidence so we don't know what they do. Do you think they wouldn't terrorize Americans to look for fines and violations? We're trusting drones to generations of people who have shown they prefer a Marxist quasi-dictator in office. Twice! And can't keep from texting while driving, or texting while walking to open manholes. Oh, go look that up on YouTube. Watch some people fall into manholes. Watch one girl fall into a fountain. And more importantly, anti-American hippie radicals and their brainwashed sheep followers. Cameras, microphones, bombs. About the only thing I've not seen are guns on them, but I'm sure once lasers become small and cost effective, that'll no longer be a concern. One step closer to the opening future battle of Terminator. Flying dirty bombs, anyone? So, what non-governmental business or organization will be the first to bastardize this technology? Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, no, it's a PETA drone, the flying technology, not Ingrid Newkirk. Yes, PETA, the radical animals rights quasi-terrorist organization, has plans to use drones, specifically to spy on hunters who they claim, quote, terrorize animals and break game laws. Of course, in order to catch the few who do, all hunters would have to be guilty and to prove an innocent. If they want to categorize all hunters that way, that's okay, I'll just categorize all PETA employees the same, and also those crazy bastards. To quote rambling Harry Reid, well it's out there, so how they have to prove they're not. Just what kind of organization is PETA? If you're thinking animal shelter, try instead slaughterhouse. Thanks to diligent people such as the Center for Consumer Freedom director Rick Berman, not the much-hated Ron Jones firing trick ruining Rick Berman, and Nathan Winograd, we now have disgusting, sickening, sleep-losing information on what PETA really does. A more proper name for PETA may be people who eradicate the animals. Since 1998, PETA has murdered, needlessly, over 29,000 cats and dogs, the majority of which were healthy and even newborns in some instances. I know what you're thinking. All no-kill shelters euthanize animals and make space and save money. This is not the case for PETA, as you will see. The Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services requires shelters to keep records of what they do, like how many animals they take in and how many they euthanize. Through them, Rick Berman gathered disturbing facts. PETA murders the majority of animals and barely adopts any. Records filed by PETA with VDAX since 1998 show a sample 2010 2345 received 63 of those transferred 44 adopted and as radio show host Mark Levin accurately called it a 93.8 percent kill rate hat tip to Mark Levin for getting me onto this 2009 2366 received 31 transferred 8 adopted 97.3% kill rate. 2008. 2,216 received, 34 transferred, 7 adopted, 95.8% kill rate. 2007. 1,997 received, 35 transferred, 17 adopted, 90.9% .9 kill rate. 2006. 361 received, 46 transferred, 12 adopted. I'll stop there because 2006 had the worst kill rate at 97.4%. That's about over 100 killed every month. 
an exciting experience for PETA founder Ingrid Newkirk, who said she would go to work early just to kill more, also saying, quote, I must have killed a thousand of them, sometimes dozens per day. But it's worse than that, because if you've been paying attention, I mentioned Virginia Records. That's right. Those 2,900 plus murder cats and dogs were done at one of PETA's locations in Norfolk. PETA has locations in other cities, including Washington, New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Basically, all your liberal breeding grounds. Oh, and London. Based on the definition of shelter in Virginia, the kill rates make PETA ineligible to follow as such, but they argued an obscure law, and they ended up letting them retain the status. 84% of the cats and dogs in the Norfolk location received were killed within 24 hours. In fact, the Norfolk location was literally going to homes, getting the pets, telling the owners they had somebody lined up to adopt them, then murdering them in the van before reaching the slaughterhouse they call a shelter. In one case, it appears they murdered the pets before even leaving the owner's driveway. They would collect animals from houses and other places in the Carolinas, kill them in the van, and then would put them in trash bags and dump them. One grocery store employee had noticed bags and finally opened them. A police sting caught them eventually. They had routinely been using dumpsters to dispose of cats and dogs they murdered. They, of course, did go to court. In 2010, one of the highest kill rates in 14 years, over at the PETA Norfolk location, New York had reached a low in euthanasia. An entire state, which received far, far more cats and dogs than one PETA location, somehow managed to kill less of them. And before you think it was isolated, multiple employees over time were involved. And they don't have to pack the kill paraphernalia up clumsily. No, they have a fancy portable kill kit. A box bigger than a taco box, ironically, with colorful bottles arranged. You should see the picture of their kill box. Peter claims they don't have the money. Yet they seem to have no lack of money when it comes to newspaper and magazine ads. They magically come up with money for fancy signs, banners, and sometimes props. Maybe they have their own printing press for dollars, because it's remarkable they can't afford to not kill animals, yet they can shell out for costly television commercials, including one claiming going vegan makes you better in the sack, and afford airtime, which can cost just below or over a million dollars. While they're euthanizing a beautiful cat, which may have given someone love and company for over a decade, they can pony up, they can pony up a $70,000 loan to an ALF arsonist, Rodney Coronado, and I don't mean the ALF who eats cats, which is not the first time they financially supported that terrorist group. Each year PETA gets more money in donations from unsuspecting pet owners and oblivious Hollywood actors like Pamela Anderson. Current estimates show they have about 35 million dollars. So, can PETA afford all these cats and dogs they claim they can't? Well, let's find out. One animal shelter I found online said it cost them about $23 per day per dog and about $21 per day per cat. For this calculation, we'll use the median of $22. Let's take the highest kill rate year of 2006. In that year, they took in 3,061 animals, yet murdered 97.4% of them. Damn near all of them. 3,061 times $22 equals $67,342. Let us then be generous and say that PETA has $30 million. $30 million divided by 67342 equals 445 years they can afford to take care of each pet and not kill them. Even if we double the cost per pet, that's still a couple hundred years. What about the multiple locations in the U.S.? Well, I only know five, but there's likely more. So now that's 3,061 times $110, which equals $336,710 to feed the animals at five locations. Now, at this math, it becomes impossible, even at $35 million, to be able to afford to feed all five locations animals for 365 days a year. Or does it? Think about it. PETA is not making real efforts to adopt. If they did, they'd have fewer animals, and with less comes a huge slash in the number of days each is there. That significantly dwindles costs. Then each adoption costs the adopter, so that's more money taken in. 
and by that time PETA will have turned its murderous reputation around and started receiving more donations. Do you think that's impossible? It's not, and we have a real-life example. Over in California, a state PETA also operates in, a shelter in Camarilla does it every year, for the most part. They're still not a no-kill, though. The shelter puts statistics online. In 2011, the shelter took in 7,497 animals, more than double what the PETA Norfolk location received in their worst kill rate of 2006. They transferred 1,389 compared to the 46 PETA transferred. They adopted 2,111 compared to the 12 PETA adopted in 2006, the year of hell. They even returned lost pets to their owners, 1,629, and they killed 2,234 for a kill rate of approximately 31%, three times lower that than the PETA Norfolk location in 2006, and they killed 2,234 for a kill rate of approximately 31%, three times lower that than the PETA Norfolk location in 2006. I don't know this location's budget, but at $22 a pet minus the ones killed, then multiplied by 365 days, that's $42 million. I think it would be fair to say, because of transfers, adoptions, and returns of lost pets, and more likely it would cost them uh, about $33 million within PETA's budget of locations in the USA, yet this one Camarillo, California shelter does it. The simple fact of the matter is, it can be done. PETA just isn't trying. They're too busy flying around advocating, making commercials, and now preparing to harass hunters. They just don't love these helpless animals. Indeed, Ingrid Newkirk has said, they don't advocate for the life of the animals. If they did, their kill rate would be 31% or lower, and their adoption rate would be 280 times that of what it was, for example, in 2006. And what everybody is overlooking? PETA doesn't have to take in more animals than they can afford to care for. This is a choice they make. They choose to create a situation where they are overburdened and murder animals to lighten their load. Oh, by the way, does the death panel for Obamacare tax, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, pass separately in the first stimulus bill, care about your grandpa or grandma as much as you and your personal doctor do? Food for thought. Case in point. At the PETA King County, Washington location, one year there was a three-day holiday. People were left to supervise the animals, but instead decided to not show up and you know, go have fun for the holiday. One employee, who was tasked with checking up on things, came in finding crying and whining pets who had run out of food and water and were sleeping and walking in their own shit and piss. Pictures were taken. You can go online and find some of those if you feel like being heartbroken. One shows a cat clinging to the cage and reaching out for an employee desperate for help. Another shows a dog sleeping in its own piss since it was caged in an area just about the size of a dog carrier. The employee was fired with claims that basically amounted to him not being company material. Meanwhile, Ingrid Newkirk, whom founded PETA, says to kill a dog if it looks like a pit bull and that I'm opposed to having children. Having a purebred human baby is like having a purebred dog. It's nothing but vanity. Human vanity. Runs PETA. Is it any wonder the kill rates are what they are? There's some serial killer traits already covered. You can only imagine what a woman like this would do if she were part of the Obamacare tax death panel. Now imagine the unelected people that the Obama administration is appointing to these positions. When Nathan Winograd spoke to a PETA receptionist, she was unaware they even had a shelter, something people in Hollywood stars are delusional over still. Even at an 85.8% .8 kill rate, Slaughterhouse more accurately describes what's going on behind their closed doors. Even at a meat processing center, which PETA protests all the time, I guarantee you, during even a three-day weekend, nobody leaves cows, chickens, or other animals destined for the slaughterhouse unfed for three days. The FDA would shut them down fast. And yet, it would be that, or any, processing plant that would get screaming angry protesters, but not PETA and the locations like the Norfolk Center. 
When you murder 85 to nearly 100% of the animals you take in, it's pretty easy to leave them for three days in their own bowel movements and with no food and water. What do they care? Meanwhile, while PETA is doing that, they are lecturing us and protesting businesses and individual people. One of PETA's big advocacy movements is against testing pharmaceuticals and other technologies on animals like rats and monkeys. Yet in 1991, when they rescued 18 rabbits and 14 roosters from a research facility, they killed them. They claimed they had no money and no room. So, then how and why did they rescue them? The rabbits could have been dumped at a no-kill shelter, and the roosters could have been a mech something or other, rather than a pointless death. In October 2012, when a truck carrying 1,600 pounds of saltwater bass had an accident in Irvine, California, and the fish died, PETA was petitioning the city so that they might put up a memorial sign for the dead fish. There are no memorial signs outside the Norfolk PETA slaughterhouse. Had these fish been in PETA's hands, it would have been okay to kill 97.4% of them on purpose. At this time, Irvine has wisely declined PETA, but PETA is still trying. And that's not the only state they are trying, tried, to get a memorial in. PETA, a few years ago, put up a billboard that had a side-by-side -side image of Jews at a Nazi death camp and chickens in a mass coop, and likened their death to what Nazis did. The sign read, Six million Jews died in concentration camps, but six billion broiler chickens will die this year in slaughterhouses. Never mind that the majority of those chickens are bred specifically to be slaughtered and wouldn't be alive otherwise. Well, if that's how they want to play it, let's run some numbers. Over a hundred people die each year from insects and animals. At PETA's Norfolk location alone, they murdered 1,600 animals. I guess PETA equals Nazis! In October 2011, PETA sued SeaWorld, claiming orcas have constitutional rights. Apparently none of the other sea life there merit a lawsuit for rights, which includes life and liberty so they can free the orcas. Hopefully not into PETA's care, because we already know rabbits, roosters, and over 2,900 cats and dogs obviously don't have such rights. And if PETA can't afford to take care of 18 rabbits and 14 roosters, and has no room, then they certainly have no room or money for orcas. Most undeniably, at a place that bought a $9,370 large walk-in freezer to store murdered animals. I don't know why they're storing them. By the way, the Humane Society is pretty much just as bad as PETA. About 16 cents of, out of every dollar goes towards the care of the animals. I wonder where the rest of that money's going. Don't donate to them either, or let them take your animals. It's a death sentence. PETA claims lies, misrepresentation, etc. Yet these quotes are their own from over the years, including Larry King Live. For example, on the aforementioned show, the Vice President of PETA in 2006 went on about how animals are killed, yet for at least 14 years the Norfolk location alone never seemed to bother him. Oh, and they used Pamela Anderson's boobs to, in that interview to promote PETA. The statistics on the death and adoptions are all provided by PETA themselves in order to comply with the Virginia law which requires them to do so. Though they'll toss around liberal buzzwords at you like big oil and big tobacco. How about big liars? PETA claims the animals are sickly or have problems that would make them hard or impossible to get rid of. Yet they are murdered in the vans before they ever get to the facilities for test and evaluation. And Camarillo has already shown by their numbers there simply just aren't that many cats and dogs that need to be put down. It's literally documented they, PETA, kill healthy animals in the van. And if you don't agree or see it their way, they go online and undergo propaganda campaigns. Oh, you know, all honest people do that. They say, for example, Yahoo Answers is, quote, a good breeding ground for activism and promotion of PETA, suggesting the thumb down post against PETA and to thumb up ones for them and to troll members against them while not answering the questions. They're pretty easy to spot, usually sporting irrational full support of PETA, but all you have to do is look for the mealy mouth liberal illogic and you spotted a troll. And there, folks, are the people who want to use drones to spy on hunters who, remember, terrorize animals and break game laws. Dun, dun, dun. It's okay to terrorize animals and break laws at PETA locations. I bet the spending of donations from people looks a lot like Jesse Jackson Jr.'s memorabilia habit.
over at the PETA executive houses like Newkirk's. They claim the drones will have no weapons. Well, these are the same people who say they have adoptions lined up then kill animals in their Death Star vans before reaching home base. Do you trust them? I wouldn't even let them watch a rock. If PETA gets to use drones to spy on hunters, then I want to use drones to spy on PETA. Drones flying in every shelter. One following every death van until it reaches the PETA slaughterhouse to make sure the animals come out alive. I want to find out what's happening in Ingrid Newkirk's house. Let's put some in there. The Humane Society, too, whom also need a public audit of donations. You know, PETA isn't breaking new ground, despite what I said earlier. The animal activist group, Shark, showing animals respect and kindness, already uses drones. One can only hope on PETA, though I haven't researched to find out if Shark is as bad as PETA. This doesn't end here. If PETA can get a drone to fly over your house, they will. If they could sneak it in, they would. And farmers, you're next. And you folks in Hollywood don't think you're immune. And if you wear fur, that goes for zoos too. Fines, jail time, setups, and lawsuits are coming. In order to use such technology responsibly, one must not be bereft of morality and heart. No good will ever come from this. When a pizza delivery place wanted to use drones to deliver pizzas, they were denied. When Shark did, they got permission. You can see where this is going for PETA. Normally, I might close with some parting words, but I think this time I shall let somebody else speak for me. To quote actress Jennifer Lawrence, Screw PETA.